Okay, we're recording. Great. Uh, so my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Uh, it's 11 a.m. on January 14th, 2022, and I call this meeting of the board to order. Um, just a few comments uh, before we get to our meeting today. Um, just wanted to remind everyone that uh, the new day and time of our regular board meetings um, are going to be Mondays at 11 a.m. However, this coming Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, so our meeting next week will be on Tuesday at 11 a.m. And while we encourage remote participation just because of kind of the you know current trends and COVID cases, um, we will have a physical location and it's our offices here in Montpelier, 89 Main Street. Um, so today, is our official public comment meeting on rules one and two. I think this deserves a little bit of elaboration before we get started. Um, pursuant to the Vermont Administrative Procedures Act, um, the board has been and will continue to collect all public comments um, that it receives about our rules, um, starting from the time that they were filed and running through at least the end of next week. Um, and then we're going to hold a series of meetings in the coming weeks to review all of these comments publicly and respond to each unique and substantive comment. And we have the ability to amend our rules um, based upon these comments. So um, these public comments and our, and our responses to them are not only helpful for the board to kind of identify and correct issues, they also become very relevant to the next stage of the administrative rules process where we present our rules, including all the public comments we, we received, to the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. That committee is really trying to ensure that everything that we've proposed in our rules is consistent with the legislative intent of our enabling legislation, but they also want to make sure, this Legislative Committee wants to make sure that we've listened to and considered every public comment, um, you know, all the people that went out of their way to read our rules and make comments on them, that the board has listened to those folks. Um, again, um, when these rules make it through that process and they're formally adopted, they do have the force of law and violations of them can result in civil penalties. They can implicate people's ability to participate in this industry. Um, so these comments really are instrumental to shaping, you know, they have been and continue to be very instrumental into how we developed these rules, the shape of the market, um, the proposed fee structure, and all the regulations that we created have really been influenced by the public. Um, today we're focused on rules one and two. Um, we're going to have a similar meeting to this um, about our remaining rules. Um, but the most helpful comments today for the board will be around rules one and two. So just a few ground rules to help facilitate this meeting. Um, we're gonna be here for the next two hours, regardless of whether people are commenting. Um, we are not gonna be responding to comments today or having a um, discussion about comments today. Um, you can ask us questions today if you'd like um, we, tr we try to collect all questions that are asked and post responses to them on our website. Um, we're just not going to be answering them today. Uh, if you have a comment, please raise your hand um, and we'll call on you in the order that you raise your hand with a few caveats. We we'll always try and start with people in the room first. Um, audio. Yeah, I think N Nelly might have accidentally muted us. All right, can, can everyone, can anyone hear us? For all of that? Yeah. Apologies folks, we're working on addressing that. Now you'll let us know when we're back, if you can hear us. I can't do it from here. That's a bummer because that was all really great explanation. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I don't have to start over again. Apologies for the lack of audio, folks. Um, 
So the people in the Cannabis Control Board office, uh, can you try maybe leaving the meeting and coming back in? I'm having difficulty unmuting you as well. Without them in here. Okay, we're on you now. Nelly, right, do you, there we go. Wonderful. Do you have any? Thank you all for your patience. Nelly, do you have any sense of how far back I should go in my comments? <laughs> do, um, do you, you know are the, just getting into you were just getting into uh, the ground rules okay. uh, of all of this. Okay. Well, I'm going to start with the ground rules for the meeting, and hopefully, everyone heard at the beginning my opening comments about the process, the stage, the stage that we're in now. So um, we are going to be here. Um, the board is going to be here for the next two hours, regardless of whether people are commenting or not. Um, we won't be responding to comments or having a discussion today. You may ask us questions. We really do try to collect those questions and post responses to them on our website. Um, but we just won't be answering direct questions today. If you have a public comment, please raise your hand. We'll call on you in the order you raise your hand with a few caveats. We um, are gonna start with the folks that have shown up to the physical location. Again, that's 89 Main Street in Montpelier. Um, then we'll move to the people that joined uh, via the link and raise their virtual hands. Um, and then we'll, take, we'll pause and um, ask people on the phone if they have comments. And when we get to that stage, if you, if you join by phone, you can hit star six to unmute yourself and we'll try and manage that process. Um, when, when commenting, please start by stating your name and where you're from. We will allow repeat comments at this meeting, um, as in the same person can comment at multiple different times over the next two hours. However, we will prioritize first time commenters over people who have already made a comment um, I'm going to try my best not to impose any time limits on people's comments unless it's looking like we have more commenters than we have time for. Um, and I will, as always, try and maintain a certain level of decorum if comments start becoming either kind of disrespectful to other commenters or if um, the comments really start to veer too far away from what's relevant to the business of the board. Um, and finally, just ask that people leave their videos and their microphones off when they're not commenting. And Nellie can help with that as well. So with that, I think um, any, any other additional statements, Kyle or Julie, that you'd like to make before you get started? No, I really appreciate uh, folks' time and energy towards this process. Ditto. Yeah. Let's get going. Great. Well, we have a few people in the room. Again, if you'd like to make a comment and you join by the link, Please raise your virtual hand, but we will start with the folks in the room. Um, so, please, the floor is yours. Can you like whoever ask from here? Ask the comments from here. If, if you wouldn't mind it's just, coming up here so the camera and the microphone can see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, based on what I understood, am I, am I able to voice uh, the five comments that I have, or do I voice one and then after, no, no, afterwards no, come back? Just mm -hmm. cycle through them. Yeah, just. Okay. Yeah. So start with my name and uh, same where you're from, you know, okay. if you're comfortable with it, it's not a requirement. Sure. Uh, my name is Michael and I'm from the Northeast Kingdom. <clears throat> and uh, the very first comment that I had was related to uh, section 2.4.1 through 2.4.3 titled security. And um, I am what you would call a, um, eco-grower and um, what, what that means is I will utilize the entire ecosystem um, to, to my advantage when growing and <clears throat> so part of how I avoid um, using pesticides and insecticides is allowing a uh, free ranging of my chickens my ducks and my guinea fowl and there is a I don't know how to quantify it, but there is an order between the birds and the dogs that I have and the ability to free range and coming up to the plants, you know, for a little bit of time while then free ranging to other spaces in which I've developed a, a balance in, in that the birds act as pest control, but at the certain level. Now, 
to get past the very first tier of growing, um, there's you require specific security features, which I understand why they're in place. However, I would like to grow past the first tier, and I'm having an issue with the fencing, in that as soon as I put a fencing in, I'm influencing the ecosystem. And um, now, as a result of putting a larger fencing in, I would thus have to use pesticides and insecticides, whereas right now I'm currently using the most environmentally uh, sustainable model that I can imagine. Um, so um, <clears throat> I would ask for special consideration for outdoor growers utilizing this method. Um, and in addition, um, the size of the property that I'm talking about, I'm talking about cultivating in the center of it. So I already have somewhat of, it's not a real fence, but somewhat of a barrier or, or boundary or border. Um, so that was the very first point that I had um, and that I see the fencing being an issue um, in terms of what I do and, and remaining uh, environmentally sound. <clears throat> Um, the second, the second thing uh, comment that I had was 2.3.6 section D, and um, this this talks about the, the state giving them giving themselves permission at any point in time to come in and um, take clones or take samples of the genetics that you're growing, and um, the reality is, I can understand why the state would like to do this if there's been a safety concern or a safety breach and the, cult, the genetics that are being cultivated pose a risk to the public health, but they've specifically written in there that they have the ability to take genetics to further the state's research into what works. And the reality is, is that some people will spend an entire lifetime, 30, their entire lives, uh, breeding and, and growing these strains, and that's what I would consider intellectual property. And I don't know of any other professions where the state's allowed to come in and take someone's intellectual property. Um, so my, my major issue being that someone like myself would spend 30 to 40 years um, of my life, you know, working on these genetics, and then ultimately um, the genetics would be taken and then, you know, redistributed to, to someone's, someone else's family or somehow the genetics get out and, um, you know, it's no longer a secure project. And why would I why would I breed my plants and why why would I work towards creating genetics um, that ultimately um, you know could could just be taken away from me in an instant? So that that was a um, that was a point that I had and and also that I'm not aware of any other um, professions that allow that. Um, so moving forward. Um, I didn't fully understand, um, I, this was 1.4.9 section C, and it's talking about creating uh, developmental development ladders. Um, and um, I'm just not, I wasn't fully sure what that meant. And, um, and I would like to be given the freedom to hire the, uh, the, the best possible candidates, irregardless of their uh, nationalities or sexual preferences or chromosomes. So um, <clears throat> I personally feel that I would like to hire whoever is the most qualified, irregardless of, um, of that. And I feel that I would ultimately be limited if I were to, if, if um, I would ultimately be limited in, in the selection of, that I could make for potential candidates um, that could serve the role in the best possible way. <clears throat> Um, let's see here. Another issue that I'm having is at 2.3.3, and this is regarding testing. Um, it states that uh, samples need to be sent in for testing within a within three weeks of harvest. And um, <clears throat> as an artisan grower, I've been experimenting with longer dry times. And this last season, for example, within my legal plants. I, I spent up to four to even six weeks to incredibly slow the dry time down. And what I found is that the trichomes continue development to continue to develop during this. And uh, so if I were to take a sample from that at three weeks, well, it would still be wet. And if I were to then send it into a lab, it would mold in the process and it would be completely unreflective to the, the product that I intend to give. So I asked for, um, 
I'd, I'd ask for some uh, wiggle room associated with, with that. Um, maybe it would be a situation where you send the sample in right before you package it or uh, after it's cured, for example. Um, I, think, I think three weeks is, uh, is a bit of a stretch in some situations. For an indoor grower, that would probably be perfect. Okay, and then, um, and the, uh, the, the, the final point that I had, uh, 4.5.3, is uh, related to alcohol consumption. And um, the way I currently operate in my, in my vegetable gardens is, which is in walking distance to where I live, is that I will occasionally drink a beer or two at the end of the day while I'm still working. And um, I could see the need to um, put this in here for people who are using tractors and are using vehicles. Um, it's against the law to use alcohol while you're operating heavy machinery and or vehicles, but I would also ask for some situations, especially when the individual was able to walk from the location of the grow directly to their home and had no intentions of driving or using these heavy machinery, I, I would ask the, that that be waived as, as well. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm unsure of the extent the state's willing to um, work with that or not. But those were the five points that I, that I had. And um, I really appreciate you all um, allowing me the opportunity to voice uh, any concerns that I had about this proposal. And in general, I, I, I thought I really liked it and I thought everyone had did a fantastic job so far. Thank you very much. I think these are all valid concerns. We're not gonna of course. address them directly today, but maybe the week after next, we'll, we'll kind of have a meeting and talk about all of these. So thank, thank you. you so much, sir. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. And if you want to comment again, you know, you'll have an opportunity. If someone says something that you want to respond to later on, you know, we'll, you'll have that opportunity over the next couple of hours. Thank you. Hello and good morning. I want to uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here, and I want to commend you all on, a, I think it was a wonderful job that uh, you've done so far, outlining all these rules. Uh, my name is Matt. I am from Wyndham County in southeastern Vermont. Um, my questions are not quite as, as pointed as the previous gentleman's as far as referencing the numbers, but I think they are general questions that do um, relate to rule, to rule one as they are. Um, my first question would just be on is the mixed use license considered small tier or not? Um, I didn't see any clarity about that in any of the rules that I've reviewed thus far. Um, my next comment would be about um, outdoor cultivators being allowed a small space indoors for starts. Of course, we know we have a short growing season. Different strains respond differently, may need different times to grow. So I think even just 20, 30, 40 square feet to start something indoors could be, could be a boon for a lot of outdoor growers. Um, my next comment would just also be about outdoors and considering is a hoop house or a high tunnel, is that considered outdoors? I didn't see anything specific on that, but that's something that can really help um, you know, growers in this, in this part of the world to achieve um, good results. And then my next question would be, is, is a greenhouse outdoors? And where is the line? Is it, is it supplemental lighting? Is it multiple crops per year? Should you be using auto flowering varieties? Is it climate control? So where do we draw the line between indoors and outdoors? Um, that was my question on that. Um, next would be about the um, requirement for reta retailers to source 25% of their flour from small tier growers. Um, I know I saw this referenced in multiple places and I just wondered if there's any chance in making that permanent. I saw that there was maybe between August and October of 2022 was supposed to be the requirement and I feel that that doesn't even really give, especially outdoor cultivators, any chance. I mean, your, the final product isn't even cured by October. so this isn't really um, a boon to small tier cultivators. I really appreciate the emphasis on keeping this small and local as much as possible. And I think that if there's any way we can make this a, a permanent staple of the program, that would be beneficial. Um, I guess my last quick comments would be about if there is any um, excise tax. I've seen in a lot of other states that there's a per pound excise tax and I just wonder if this is something that would be good to know ahead of time so that growers when they're actually making their business plans can take that into account. And my last comment would just be about a timeline for provisional licensing. It seems at this point like we may even be going into a, a 2023 before um, growers in the state can really be up and running if we're pushing it 
towards the spring and towards May and June, the actual licenses are going to be, you know, issued to people. I mean, there's infrastructure that needs to be built. There's genetics that need to be sourced, and I mean, this is something that takes a bit of time and planning. So, um, if we could get any clarity on that, I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for driving up today. Of course. I don't see anyone else in our physical location. Um, so why don't we turn to people that join via the link. Um, if you join via the link, uh, please raise your virtual hands and we will uh, call on you in the order that you raise your hand. Thank you, Ben. Next, we have T.S. Hey, folks. My name is Tim. Um, I just have a couple of clarifications and um, one comment. Um, concerning Rule 1, uh, there is a nursery license that looks to be included in a retail license. And I was wondering if there is growth that is associated with that or how these clones or mother plants are kept by a retail business or if they're stored elsewhere. Um, and a comment, I've been reaching out to a variety of banks in New England, Vermont specifically, and most of them are not lending for this purpose right now. And I know it's been an excellent um, perspective of you folks to get the small folk in there first um, but it will be very difficult for anybody without you know VC from somebody else to get in and still own their company without being able to raise capital from um, local banks um, and that's all thank you Tim Next, we have Will Roberts. Hello, uh, I'm Will Roberts. I'm the prevention coordinator at uh, Central Vermont Direction of Students uh, Prevention right here in Montpelier, and we serve uh, Washington County. And I would just like to emphasize, I know you all have talked a lot about this over the, over the months uh, that I've been um, I would like to address a couple, just sort of emphasize a couple of really necessary components of uh, the legislation. One being buffer zones for uh, for establishments. This is this is kind of a, a pretty important point. So they, it needs to include the buffer zone needs to include uh, schools, child care centers libraries, playgrounds, sports facilities, or rec fields, um, and even parks. And the reason why is that it, you, we don't, we don't want to have uh, establishments being close by any of these other, uh, other places where youth congregate, youth uh, attend classes, youth attend sporting events, um, just because it, 
to have that normalized behavior sends the wrong message to youth, right? And 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 that's something that we don't want because we we want to help kids be safe. We want to help kids, uh, you know, have responsible use when they are actually adults, right? The other piece that I want to talk about is um, the cap on THC levels. So I know that um, it's been recommended that we cap that at 15%. And I know that um, that was not initially taken taken up, but I'm gonna emphasize that that's actually pretty important uh, because with higher levels, um, more higher risks of psychosis, especially if you have any, um, you know, uh, pre-existing conditions. So you wanna cap that uh, at a lower amount. 15% is a pretty uh, high amount anyway. So having it at a higher amount than that just leads to greater risks for, uh, for users. So again, thank you for hearing me out. And um, I, I think you all are doing a great job and I appreciate all of the work that you're putting in. Thank you, Will. Next is Jill. Hi, uh, thank you for, um, for being here and thanks for your comments. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of the Vermont Medical Society, the American Academy of Pediatrics and Vermont Psychiatric Association. And um, I won't go on, I did put in about six pages of comments so we won't go through all of that today. But I did want to highlight a couple of things that uh, we haven't um, spoken about before, and that's in proposed rule two on 2.2.9 on the packaging. Um, we highly support all of the um, regulations that you have suggested in this section. Uh, we would just say that child resistant packaging is actually pretty difficult. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission has said that it should not be relied on. And so um, one of the things that just came out recently was a study out of Ontario, um, January 7th, 2022, um, that just showed a ton of young kids under the age of 10 that had gotten into edible products. So one of the things that the study suggests is really making sure that those edible products do not look attractive to kids, do not look like candy. And, you know, so going a little bit beyond the packaging of, of what the products look like and how um, this can lead to cannabis poisonings in the under age 10. Um, so that's colors, shapes, flavors. And then just to clarify, we've been in the press on this and then we, we also have, um, put in comments before about the warning labels, including acute physical and mental health risks associated with a higher THC um, potency and just cannabis use in general. And just clarifying that we had suggested that it be a very small um, warning that includes psychosis, impaired driving, addiction, suicide attempt, uncontrollable vomiting, et cetera. And we had some concern, and maybe you looked at this closely, maybe the Department of Health looked at this closely, but it seems like with the longer sentences and the warning label that people won't be able to focus on that. And so that's why our suggestion was really just those six things and keeping it short and tight and bold um, uh, and including the mental health risks, especially right now. The other thing that I wanted to talk about as in proposed rule to also, um, it, you had it in 2.2.11, and that's regarding age baiting. And what we've seen with uh, vaping and tobacco um, products, age baiting, is that it has not been successful in um, keeping youth from buying these products. And so I think there needs to be a real focus on effective age gating. 
Um, in our comments, we did put, a, it's a somewhat dated article from 2015, um, but it, it was about um, a North Carolina study in which kids, um, there was 98 orders for vaping products and 75 were successful out of that for underage kids that were trying to get through age gating. So just flagging that for everyone that that, that will take a little bit more work and I think that you need to dig deep on, on effective strategies around that because what, what we hear is that kids can get anything they want online. Um, and that that's just a, it's also an area for advertising that we're um, highly concerned about how you would regulate and how you would keep that to only 15% of youth under the age of 21. There's so many different kinds of social media right now and you know kids are far more savvy and um, so that's, it's a, a big concern for us and then we also um, put in the comments, and we, we've said this before, is, you know, what kind of data collection system? I didn't see anything in the um, proposed rules around that um, in terms of advertising and um, how that works with the density of retail shops and the youth use rate. So I think just having that data collection is is very important for us and um, you know possibly the you know that would be directed to the Department of Health. Um, and uh, I think that that's the, the bulk of our comments. Um, we did also reiterate the buffer zone that, that we think that um, there should be a minimum of a thousand foot buffer zone between all cannabis retail outlets and any schools, parks, college campuses, and child care facilities. And um, I think on my comments, some of the references did not get on there, so I will send in a corrected copy um, to you all. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. And we'll, um, we did receive the written comments as well, so we'll take a look at those. Thanks. All right, next is Ebo. Good morning. Uh, this is Ebo with Gaston Weed Company. First of all, I want to thank you guys for all your hard work. Very exciting uh, point we're at now, you know, getting these reps in. Um, a couple, one thing that's really kind of like keeps coming back to me and as we talked about, you know, some of these potential like general store type licenses and or the event licenses, I've heard a lot about you know, like being out of the public eye. Uh, you know, for me, you know, as a state who wants this, who wants an adult use or a recreational market, um, I think like making sure that it's like tucked away, it's like a, it's taboo. So like, let's be like forward thinking, like Vermont is the state and like embrace this, this space that we're bringing to the state, right? Like it's recreational use. I think if you like a lot of the, um, stuff I've heard is like states that do have recreational or adult use, the, the youth consumption numbers are down. Um, but let's not make it so taboo. Like let's let's embrace it. Let's not like worry about it being tucked away so people can't see it. Like it's you know it's a pretty awesome thing that we're doing, and I just think you know the you know the thousand feet from schools, churches, colleges, daycares. I mean that that for one that really limits your availability to put in a, put in a store or, or cultivation or whatever, but like, let's normalize this. You know, there's a liquor store on every corner. Um, you could go in and buy enough vodka to kill yourself and your whole family with your child. Um, I don't know, I, I just think it's important to like embrace it and normalize it. Like don't make it so it's like a, you know, like a dirty corner of the store or whatever. Like it's, um, you know, that's just my, my two cents on that. Um, that's it. Thanks, Evo. Next is Amelia. Hey guys, <laughs> happy Friday. Um, 
So I just wanted to touch really quick on packaging, um, having read back through rule two. Um, I just wanted to mention again that often child resistant packaging has a big overlap with packaging that is not friendly to people with certain disabilities, um, you know, arthritis, uh, various mobility issues. Um, so I would just really urge that when you talk about child resistant packaging, you also factor in uh, what is and is not easy for an adult, perhaps, to open. Um, as somebody who struggles with arthritis myself, oftentimes I have to have other people open things for me um, that is considered child resistant, which is annoying. Um, and then as far as, as far as buffer zones go, uh, I think when you talk about a buffer zone in regard to a childcare facility, Vermont has a really high number, I think, of at-home child daycares. So what you have is you have obviously people running daycares out of their home and out of their residence. And so if you, would, if you put in a buffer zone of X amount of fee, whether we do the 500 to 1,000 of child care facilities, all of a sudden you're not regulating the amount of space from you know, a school, you're regulating the amount of space from anybody's home. And so that really narrows uh, the amount of available space for a retail location. And just kind of echoing what Evo said, Evo said, um, you know, this is, this is something to be normalized. And I understand that we're not normalizing youth consumption. And I think you guys get that too. Uh, we're just normalizing the plant and we're normalizing not stigmatizing people that use the plant, that buy the plant, that legally consume the plant. And I just, just want to point out um, that it is not the cannabis control board's job to, uh, to parent other people's children. Um, it is not your job to make sure that you know, individuals' children are not thinking about trying cannabis or about getting into the cannabis that their parents buy. Like there is a certain level of parental responsibility that comes with being a cannabis consumer and there's only so much that I think you guys can prevent as an individual board. Um, so I just would, yeah, that was just a point I wanted to make. I uh, appreciate everything you guys are doing. Hope you have a good weekend. Bye. Thank you, Amelia. Next is Mariah. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Mariah Flynn. I'm um, uh, a parent in Essex Junction, a high schooler and a middle schooler, and also um, I work in the substance misuse prevention field. Um, and But also I care a lot about the environmental impact of cannabis growth, so I think that this group has spent some time thinking about that, and I really appreciate it in, um, in the, the first uh, rulemaking, the kind of acknowledgement um, around looking at the water um, and, um, and the water use and the capacity in a community to be able to manage that. I think that's one of the things I would continue to explore um, looking at both the energy use and the water and the water supply that are used with um, cannabis grows um, is different than most other plants that we grow. Um, and so the impact is different. And I think I'm really concerned about the um, long-term environmental impacts that some of the other states are seeing around um, increasing cannabis grows. And so I, the one thing that I would say maybe I haven't seen reflected here yet is what our evaluation of that over time might be um, and how we're looking at, um, you know, in this in this provision, I saw the kind of looking at individual communities and what the impact might be, but like as a state overall, having some way to evaluate that um, and respond and make changes to rules as we need to, to ensure that we're not having, um, you know, increasing our environmental effect. Um, so that's kind of aside from my prevention, um, my prevention focus, um, which honestly, as a as a parent of teens and um, as someone who kind of looks at substance abuse rates in our state, um, we continue to have some of the highest substance use rates in the nation for alcohol and cannabis, um, and so. Um, so that's the piece that I'm really interested in, and I appreciate Jill from the Vermont Medical Society's all of those points that she made around packaging and um, 
and the warning labels. And I just wanted to reiterate that that I think that um, I was I was disappointed with the warning labels that were chosen um, because I think that they're not really. Um, acknowledging what we know from the current research around cannabis. Um, and I think that um, while I appreciate some of what's on there, um, it, it really is um, missing some of what the current science says around the, the particularly mental health connection to um, regular cannabis use that I think needs to be better reflected there. Um, and, um, and the kind of the there to me there was a piece around um let me make sure i have it in front of me while i say it um around you know it may uh, in the language it says it may cause harm to the developing brain but i think the science is pretty clear that it does cause harm to the developing brain so the the lack of um kind of really clear language there is a little bit concerning to me um if we're really trying to prevent use use um, and then the other thing I wanted to note um, was the, um, again, the buffer zones. I think, you know, I think some in some of this, I've really appreciated, I actually, in all of this, I really appreciated the board's attention to really trying to think through all of these pieces. And I think the only thing I sometimes get concerned about in looking at this and how things have developed is that sometimes we choose the what seems manageable in terms of um, causing regulations or in terms of the regulations and not what is best practice. So I think, you know, uh, what I've looked at around the research is that best practice in terms of buffer zones would be a thousand foot barrier from youth serving organizations or schools. Um, that most of the, you know, we don't have a ton of research around this, but we do have is kind of based on a thousand feet is the better parameter. So I would just note that that, you know, if we want to really create a science focused or research focused way that we're approaching this um, to use best practice in some of this pieces. And and I um, and one of the things that I appreciate is because we have this opportunity, you know, we have two legal substances already. Um, and so we have the potential to do better. So I would um, I kind of just wanted to respond to the fact that I don't think that we are trying to normalize cannabis use in Vermont. I don't think that the, in general, our a goal in any substance use should not be to normalize it because that is um, not in the best interest of our state. Um, you know, what we want to normalize is healthy, um, is healthy behaviors for folks. So what we're what I think people really are thinking that they are hoping for is a lack of not stigmatizing people, which is different than not normalizing. So I just wanted to kind of make that distinction that in for our state, when it comes to any legal substances, we it's more cost effective for us if people do not use substances <laughs> um, that we end up having a longer term impact from substance use, um, particularly if people develop problematic use. So, um, so just wanted to kind of acknowledge that and make sure we we all have a sense that um, substance use in general doesn't have societal benefits for us. Thank you, Mariah. Next is THC Analytics. Hello, folks. Thank you for hearing us out again. Uh, I just had a, a comment about uh, rule two and under your definitions under uh, harvest law. Uh, it, uh, it says means a grower's harvested, harvested cannabis product produced during a single growth season in a continuous era containing the same cultivar variety. And the reason I bring that up is because on rule walk 229, I believe, when you start talking about uh, testing requirements, uh, under uh, testing requirements, you have harvest law um, for trim for TC compliance. Um, that would mean that anybody who grows anything over a thousand over a thousand feet, anything, uh, anything, and uh, what, anything between one plant and twenty thousand feet, you only have to test once if you have the same cultivar and it's the same growing season. 
where there's one plan for 25,000 plants. Uh, I'd just like to see a little bit more clearance on that um, because, uh, again, it's ambiguous. I can, I, I can fit in a thousand feet, I can fit one plan or you know, a thousand plants in there. And if that means that I only have to test a fraction of, the, of that plant, of those a thousand plants, then you know, it kind of defeats the purpose of the, of the test itself. Um, but that's my only comment on that. Um, thank you very much for your work. You guys have a good day. Thanks. Thanks for flagging that for us. Next is Damien. Hi, my name is Damien Evans from um, Morrisville. And um, my comment is just in regard of the retail cannabis license from my understand how it's tied to the address and location and everything. Um, just would like some consideration to being able to like move our license to another location if we want to move to a new area and everything. Like plan on being in a strip mall at first, but then I also plan on building my location with just like the move to there and everything. So just like a relocation fee, something to think about and everything, since I didn't see anything like that, just a comment I had. Thanks, Damien. So um, I don't see any hands raised from people that joined via the link. So why don't we move to, oh, there's one, right, Nelly? Yep, we just had two more. First Great. up is Sean. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to hear everybody's comments. Um, I don't understand why there's such a clear delineation between cannabis and alcohol in terms of trying to destigmatize and also just bring some semblance of normalcy of a product in a market. So uh, the proposed tax rates should now become more in line with how we're currently taxing alcohol sales. Um, also, THC caps should be removed <clears throat> uh, and not necessarily put even further back at a proposed 15% like some of the other commenters that would remove and negate the last 50 years of both scientific and agricultural work that a lot of folks have been doing. Um, delivery and online sales need to be done in a way that is customer friendly. As soon as a person hoping to purchase through an online or a delivery fashion cannot have that easily done from a licensed retailer, they will go back to the black market. They will go on to whatever the easiest and secure social media platform is and find somebody that will deliver them whatever they're looking for in short order. Uh, please, please, wherever you can, be an advocate of not attaching the vape tax to cannabis-related consumption products or devices. Um, Tier three manufacturing needs a little bit better uh, definition, uh, maybe in like rules 1.6, it's just kind of open that that'll still be determined in, in some time frame from the board. Uh, vendor and employee sampling, I noticed was uh, pretty clearly defined that samples will not be consumed on a licensed premise. Where does that leave the social nature of the substance and product testing in general. Uh, where where do these samples get consumed? How does the conversation get had? Uh, so perhaps removing or clearly defining that perhaps uh, sampling could be done on a licensed premise as long as employees are clocked out or there is some form of security measure built in if you're trying to avoid having employees on the clock while potentially intoxicated. Um, I get that, that's appreciated. Um, certainly trying to prevent child use and as it relates to packaging, um, but I also noticed that packaging says that it needs to be opaque. Uh, opaque packaging does not translate to a very customer friendly experience of being able to look at and try and understand the product that they're purchasing. 
Um, and I noticed one other thing in security, uh, 2.5.1 section F, that the board can request pretty much any and all parameters of the security system and operational functionality of an establishment. That now means the board is responsible to upkeep the operational security of every licensed establishment that you request that information of. And if for some reason the board's database is breached in that regard, anybody now has free reign to a, a retail establishment's security protocols, systems, uh, SOP, and so on. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for the specificity. Um, Nelly? Next is Tito. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, my name is Tito. I represent the Burn Collective. And uh, I will be submitting all of my, uh, all of my analysis on, on rules one through five this week. But just today, to focus on, um, again, the, the commercial building requirements. Um, if somewhere in your recommendations you can uh, recommend to relax the commercial building requirements for, let's say, two years, I mean, you know, we're all we're all getting started in this. A lot of us um, who have been growing cannabis for a long time have not run a commercial facility. So I know for me, we're we're only going to go with a tier two. We're going to start small, and we absolutely have plans on expanding. Let's say in about two years. And I'm sure a lot of other people feel the same way. So if there's a way to relax the commercial building requirements for two years um, and uh, things like um, insulation requirements, you know, bringing a building up to exactly R40 when maybe it's R33 or something, and it's like, I mean, what tremendous cost that's going to add to have to uh, re-insulate the entire commercial building when in two years we might just knock the whole thing down and start over. Uh, and uh, you know, handicap bathrooms. The requirements have to have um, uh, you know the 62-inch turnaround, um, and uh, you know these things that maybe at first are really not that important. Um, you know, and, and maybe we could relax it a little bit for two years. Let um, you know the the whole legacy market uh, get in there and get started, and and um, and then and then require that let's say two to two years down the road. Uh, also. Uh, I agree with Evo. Um, let's not tuck us away. Uh, and, and on that note, uh, the we have to not count inside of store visual things as outdoor advertising. Uh, I think that could be really, really terrible. And uh, that's going to create like a, a really seedy feeling, which is it, you know you're going to see all these stores with these blacked out window fronts. I mean, nobody wants that. I cannot imagine having to black out the front of the burn gallery because if you look through the window you could see something that said the word cannabis or something. I mean uh, I think you gotta listen that too. Uh, but thank you all so much and hopefully everybody has a great day. Thank you Tito. Next is Allison. Hi everyone. Uh, good morning. I'm Allison Link. I live in Morrisville and I'm parent of three kids. I also work for our local substance prevention coalition, Healthy Lamoille Valley. So I'm glad to be here and the opportunity. Um, so the first thing I want to mention, so last night we hosted an event, Teens and Cannabis, and just to reiterate, um, you know, we hear lots of um, data out there that, uh, you know, comes through public comment and elsewhere, but I know you've done some thorough research. We've also provided from um, the prevention community and others that really the huge impact on uh, youth and teens uh, that cannabis has and even that a re retail market um, would have. And that the one of the main things is looking at data longitudinally, looking at data, um, you know, not just at one point in time and to be able to look underneath what the data means. Like, for example, um, just because, you know, the question is not why hasn't uh, cannabis um, use in teens gone up with uh, legislation, and that's not necessarily the case, but if that is a data point that someone does see, 
it's the question might be why hasn't it gone down like the other substances had trended going down and why has it maintained the same? So I think looking at the data with uh, different lenses, especially longitudinally is important um, and nuances are even related to potency and other pieces and happy to send um, a copy of the recording from last night's session that um, with Dr. John Cyril's. Uh, two, I would just want to mention um, outlet density, not just of the um, of retail outlets, but also of any other licensees. Uh, and thinking about density, we've heard a lot about buffer zones bef um, before and um, the buffer zones, but I was also thinking about with respect to density um, and considering even the connection between buffer zone and density, I guess, in distance between uh, licensees, um, whether it's retail uh, or other uh, other licenses that, um, you know, when working with local municipalities on what their potential regulations might be, in addition to what um, your proposals are and what is passed in the legislature, that seems to be coming up for some folks. Um, and with respect to funding, I know there's a set amount of um, tax that's been earmarked for prevention. And just to reiterate the importance that that goes to VDH and that, um, you know, the VDH already doing so much of the prevention work that the folks, um, that, that it really gets to the health department to be able to figure out, okay, now what do we do with that? Um, my last piece that I wanted to mention is something that's coming up with some of the towns that um, I'm working with. Um, so, so some folks are starting to um, ask for their, from their towns for permits to start building um, facilities uh, for manufacturing or growing or whatever they're doing. And that some of that is not necessarily in alignment with what the recommendations from the CCB are. So, um, and they surely don't have licenses yet. Um, for cultivation or because they haven't been issued yet. So what may happen will be vacant buildings that don't align with, uh, you know, either like those folks don't get licenses or those folks um, are not, um, you know, in regulation with what winds up being the regulation of like, let's say um, the, the amount of space uh, so just to highlight that, I don't know what that might mean for, um, you know, your work moving forward, but that's happening on the ground in local municipalities uh, and is, uh, you know, something that I guess folks who will be applying for licenses would be good to, to know and, and as the rulemaking becomes more set, but knowing that the rulemaking will also evolve. So thank you so much for the opportunity to comment and have a good weekend. Thanks, Allison. And I know uh, I at least would like to watch that video. So maybe Nelly can get in touch with you about getting a link for us. Thanks. Next is Ron. Hi, uh, so this is Ron from Mr. Z Craft Cannabis. Um, I just wanna make two comments. First of all, completely agree with Tito. Um, I really, 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 really would like to request that you know the CCB please work to help relax commercial building requirements for two years. I think that was a great suggestion on Tito's part. Um, you know this is really an onerous process, and and you know we are doing everything we can to comply with that. But you know we were just quoted for three hundred dollars per square foot, which is I think an insane number. Everyone can say that uh, you know without doing the math on hand. Um, so yeah, relaxing those requirements would be incredibly helpful for smaller growers such as ourselves to enter the market. Um, second, I would like to do with Evo, um, and we are trying to destigmatize cannabis consumption. You know, I, I'm speaking as a 29-year-old man. I, frankly, the majority of people that I think have been on this call have been older people, substantially older, you know, as is the makeup of the state. Uh, you know, I was a teenager not so long ago, and let me say, if you gave the sneaker on a product that's going to entice them, they're going to do what they want, and they're going to go for what they want, you know? So, so let's make sure that we are creating these laws um, you know, trying to think about, uh, you know, destigmatizing the product and ensuring that, you know, medical patients can obtain what they need to obtain um, and that we're not, you know, we're being realistic about, about consumption and how this should play out here. Um, and those are my two comments. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Next is Glenn. Yeah, hi. How are you all doing? Um, so, my name is Glenn Anderson. I live out here in Waterbury Center. I've been out here for three decades and uh, came up to Vermont uh, to go to UVM and stuck around. 
Uh, my son uh, recently just went to Castleton. Uh, he's now out in Chicago at this uh, SAIC, it's an art institute. And while he was at Castleton, he um, went through the cannabis program there. And it's actually a phenomenal program. Somebody that's been in the industry for a while, you know, I sort of listened in. Um, and I think that the state's doing some great stuff to you know, actually encourage uh, this industry. Um, and as somebody that literally <laughs> brought him in uh, to an intern on a farm where we grew at the tier six uh, level for hemp, licensed through the Agency of Agriculture, um, you know, we literally, in the tier six, proposed regulations, obviously, and uh, these rules here. But, you know, we uh, were able to uh, do some pretty phenomenal things uh, from a research and development front. And, you know, that translated into an internship that was actually, ironically, fully paid for by the state because that was his uh, senior high school year. Um, so that was a program the state offers to public schools, that, well, actually to all schools. Um, where students can go and um, learn. And he was actually um, 17 at the time of uh, completion of that program. Um, and now he's off in Chicago, a licensed state where I cannot actually uh, run over there and say, hey, you, know, you, gotta, uh, you can't do that. And so he's now 18 in a big city that has graduated on, is over in college, and he's doing great things. I'm really proud of him. Um, and really uh, excited about the program at Castleton. I think it did some phenomenal things. Uh, and I've met some of the other graduates of that program. So I guess the thing that I'm trying to drive at here, and I'm trying to truncate this and maybe supply some writtenness to you um, on the full set of rules, not just one or two, but as the packaging comes up, um, I am neurodiverse. I am somebody that thinks atypically. I have been prescribed all sorts of medicines uh, for that by uh, the healthcare industry. Um, I really do find efficacy in Adderall for sure, um, but I find a great deal of efficacy in uh, cannabis specifically. And so for that reason, um, you know, I pushed my doctors many, many years ago to help get cannabis trials moving forward in Vermont, and specifically for neurodiversity for what I go through. They did not, but they were very willing to do, to open up a prescription for Vicodin for my back pain. And that was just an open script. So my point being that this drug that kills no one, right, in all time ever, is being compared to alcohol, a drug that kills 300 Vermonters on average every single year and 80,000 Americans every single year. And we're having this asking a conversation for medical people proposing ideas of packaging to make a drug that kills absolutely no one look like it's the devil. And I can't help but think that we are trapped in the war on drugs. And I do see the work the CCB is doing, and I do appreciate it. I want to just make that point very clear. But there's a lot of us that speak about normalization, and we realize you're trapped in a set of rules that a legislature put together. And at that very same level, we see them manipulating these rules, trying to push uh, you know, and whisper ideas into your space. And you have the power to push that back. And I do highly encourage you to, because quite frankly, I support my son's work. I want him to come back to Vermont. I want him to be a vigorous uh, human being that lives his truth, not necessarily in this industry per se, but what I do want to see is a space here in Vermont where innovation can thrive, where the youth aren't told they're bad because they harmed their brain on something that we, we know kills no one. When there's wet bars in their parents' home that can kill them from the toxicity of the alcohol poison. So as people are advocating for increased packaging, that as a neurodiverse individual is so obscenely offensive on every level, you know, that a medicine that literally in medicine that we find increasingly studies from Israel that speaks to the autistic community, uh, other community, uh, Canadian studies that speak to the, the uh, ADD efficacy in treating ADD. I mean, so many pieces that are on the table, proven facts, and yet we're hearing hearsay about how alcohol and tobacco are the exact same thing as cannabis. Well, we know the data statistics of death alone are not even close to being comparable. But the only reason we're having this conversation now is because it was regulated and legislated into Title VII. 
Now, I'd oppose, I mean, I'd oppose that vehemently, but I do support, I had supported it under Title 26, which is occupations and professions. And so while I can't go backwards and ask the legislature to rewrite those laws so that the titles actually make sense in how we do it and how we legislate it relative to potentially uh, more like a vet tech or a tattoo parlor or something else that just doesn't kill people. So I guess what I'm saying is you have the power. I really do hope, I do hope to come before you and get a license, not just for the farm that we crop share at and not just for you know some friends of ours that are in a collective that want to put together a, a retail license here in Waterbury, but for all the reasons that I want to contribute to this economy and bring back my son and all these other people that want to be part of this community that will get pushed out and squeezed out because of all the technicalities that we can choose to not layer in here to appease a few bunch of squeaky wheels that want to use bad data science. So in any event, I'll submit some uh, written rules. I do appreciate your time and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Glenn. All right, next is Phil. All right, thank you guys uh, very much for all that you do. It is definitely greatly appreciated. Um, wanted to bring up a point that was already mentioned and just kind of reiterate it. Uh, 2.3.3 under testing. Uh, testing for potency of a crop must take place within the three week period preceding a harvest. Um, I think as a cultivator, as a consumer, and as a board, I think ultimately you'd want the, the testing results on the product to actually reflect what the product is. Um, and anybody who's cultivated knows that there's a lot of development that happens in the last three weeks um, of the plant. And so, you know, requiring within the three week period preceding the harvest, I just don't think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I do think that there should probably be a time frame as far as the earliest you could test. Uh, but maybe just changing that to having it tested uh, before it's the final packaging. I think that would make the most sense because again, I, I personally want my percentages on the product to actually reflect what the product is. Um, and I, I think that would be incredibly helpful. And then um, one other comment I wanted to make, uh, there was a gentleman asking about outdoor plants and being able to bring them indoors. I just wanted to point out that that is already reflected in Rule uh, 2, Section 4.7. Um, uh, um, other plants, cannabis, plant seeds, and clones in propagation or vegetative phase of development may be kept indoors during winter months when outdoor cultivation is not possible, provided that outdoor cultivation licensees may not cultivate cannabis indoors. Um, I think that's a, a great thing. Just wanted to point out that it is already addressed. Um, Apart from that, though, I, uh, again, appreciate everything you guys are doing. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. So I don't see any other hands up. Certainly, um, you know, if you would like to make a comment. Oh, all right. All right, it's uh, Nick at ForbinsFinest.com. We can hear you, Nick. Okay, great. Hey, how are you guys doing? Good. Uh, I just wanted to, I have a couple, uh, there are actually more questions uh, than comments, but a, a few uh, few items that uh, we've been wondering about that I haven't seen addressed um, really well is uh, the, the time frame as far as upgrading from uh, a tier one or a tier two to the next tier. Um, we're curious what that looks like, or if there has been any discussion on um, what the requirements would be and how soon something like that could happen um, based on the market and how uh, quickly some of these companies can uh, expand. You know, a few other people have mentioned that, and so. You know, we want to apply for the license that makes the most sense for us, uh, but I think a lot of cultivators are anticipating expansion within the first year or two. So that, was, that was the first question. The last two, uh, two items can kind of be rolled roll together. Um, our company is not planning on uh, manufacturing, and so we would be looking to license manufacturers and processors to uh, 
you know, work with our uh, material to produce, you know, concentrates or edibles. Uh, if we are wanting to brand our own products but can't manufacture them ourselves, uh, uh, I'm hoping to see a, a, a way to transfer those materials or to be able to, um, you know, hire out manufacturing and then be able to retail some of our own products. I don't know if that would, I don't know if, if we would have to receive a license, a manufacturing license to be able to do that or if we would just have to hand off our, our material and then it would be white labeled essentially and then and branded. It really comes down to branding. And then the last question is the three rolls is the same. You know, uh, we're, we're, we really want to package all of our own products um, in-house for quality control purposes. And um, you know, pre-rolls are another item that we are interested in. And, and, I was curious as to whether that would be considered a manufacturing of the product or if, you know, if we're able to package our own uh, flower products, uh, would we be able to pa pa package our own um, free rolls and, and sell those as a, as a cultivator without a manufacturing license? And then that goes hand in hand with the, the concentrates or edibles if we can work with other companies to do that work. What does that look like? Thanks, Nick. Um, so just a reminder that we are collecting these questions and these comments. We'll try our best to answer them in the coming weeks, um, but we're not going to respond directly today. Um, uh, Sean, I see your hand up yeah. again. Um, I, we're just going to, I'm just going to move to the folks on the phone first and then back to the people in the room and then I'll, we'll come back to you next. Okay. But leave your hand up. So sure, thank you. Um, so if anyone joined via the phone, um, you can hit star six to unmute yourself if you'd like to make a public comment. And I'll just give it a second. Yeah. Somebody unmuted themselves, great. Right? We did have someone on mute. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. Hi, it's Jeffy J with Gold Growth Unit. Uh, thank you guys for holding this. Public comments here, and I just uh, I said something in these bags uh, about the adding mixed tiers. So I just wanted to make a public comment on it, just in case some of you didn't listen to or you guys weren't able to look at it yet. Um, so I'm just really encouraging to see um, some multiple mixed use tiers. I think when we ended the meeting earlier this week, you guys were thinking about increasing the outdoor camp or uh, outdoor plant count in keeping the indoor 1,000 square feet for the second tier up. Um, so I just really wanted to discourage that. Um, again, I wrote a, a little letter on it so you can take a look at why. Um, but really to do maybe three mixed tiers and just keep it real simple for you guys. I know you guys have so many details to work out. But just to keep it at 1,000 square feet, 100 outdoor plants, 2,000 square feet, 200 outdoor plants. Uh, 3,000 square feet and then 300 out here. So just three tiers, um, we can revisit it as the years um, for each year and see what would be demanding. Uh, but I think that uh, just going ahead and getting multiple mixed tiers is going to benefit um, the TCB's mission in multiple ways. Um, you know, encouraging outdoor meat like growing over indoor cultivation and those one your mission, um, encouraging small cultivators uh, by reducing barriers to entry and facilitating innovation uh, to support small cultivators and small businesses. Um, what else? It helps, um, oh, and we're really excited for the ability to pick and choose the role that works for them. Uh, but since the legislature won't let us have multiple licenses in each uh, part of the supply chain, they do it off with that. And then I think it would also help uh, ease some of the frustration people are having with the definition of canopy size uh, because of the whole bag that they don't need to be caring about. But all of these things, um, you know, would be a win. So take a look at that. Um, and if we could start prioritizing cultivation a little bit just with the answers you guys put out. Um, 
they may be early licensing applications, something around cultivation, um, just because, you know, obviously cultivation is going to affect everything else in the supply chain. Um, so if we can just start getting things out so those of us waiting to get a cultivation license can be ready to rock and roll um, would be great. Also, um, just a shout out to Michael, um, it's a way to growing methods. Um, and you know, allowing chickens to be raised in order to take care of pets. Um, we also operate that way. So, um, and I know that's also what you guys want to support the sustainability and environmentally friendly. So, uh, I second think on that. And then also the comments on um, testing, um, you know, requiring to get meat, um, obviously, as a vertical time. Um, it would really be a lot better if we just made it from the packaging. So anyways, um, lastly, someone mentioned that the whole thing is supported uh, by us, the public. Um, especially the ones that have really been with you guys in all these meetings. And I second that. I hope you guys know that uh, we are here to support you also when you go to legislation and appreciate all the work you guys are doing and just recognize how many fucking details you guys have to work out. I can't even imagine. So, bravo, uh, and we got this. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jesse. Anyone else who joined via the phone, um, you can hit star six to unmute yourself to make a public comment. There's nobody else on the phone. Okay. Um, so, um, I'm just going to just reset very quickly, remind folks. Uh, I've seen a couple people join since we originally started. Um, we're going to be here for about an, another 45 minutes, um, regardless of people who are making comments. Um, you know, uh, please raise your virtual hand um, if you join via the link. We have a few people in the room with us that we're going to turn to next. Um, you can make repeat comments if you've already commented, if you've heard something or something else came to mind. Please, um, you know, feel free to make another comment. Um, and again, we're in the phase of our rulemaking um, where we are going to consider um, and respond to every kind of unique substantive comment that we receive. And, um, and then we're gonna, we can continue to make amendments to our rules throughout this process. Um, so it's important for us to really hear from the folks that are gonna be regulated by the CCB, what's unworkable, what's duplicative, what you know is in conflict with your current growing practices um you know everything that um, we can do to kind of make this a uh, partnership um and to make this a kind of thriving equitable market is really important to us um so with that i'm just going to turn once again to the folks in, in the room any additional comments you'd like to make i had some but throughout the process most of my comments were addressed okay um, just one additional comment, I suppose, going off of um, what the last one was saying about the multi-tier for the mixed-use licensing. Uh, I had that question about, is there a small-tier mixed-use? I guess that would be, could there be a small-tier mixed-use if there wasn't? I mean, even if it's not a 1,000 square feet and 50 plants, if it's something cut down from there, I think that would offer um, small growers a lot of flexibility and a lot of room for innovation. And yeah, and also just more consistent supply chain from the small growers because if we're so based on outdoor, 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 well, as I've seen in the charts, we're going to have a glut of product at certain times in the autumn, and then we may have, you know, you may have retailers looking elsewhere. Maybe I'm not sure. Bigger players where if we could keep it small and local, that would that would be better for us. I think. Yeah. So. Um, We'll turn back to the folks that joined by the link. Um, Nelly, can you help us just make sure we get the order right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, next up is Sean. Uh, maybe just make an interesting proposal about the mixed uh, tiers. It's now split between square footage and plant count, but what if the mixed tier outdoor portion was also a square footage? Uh, it you know a plant count doesn't necessarily accommodate for folks' style in terms of doing uh, light up grow, auto flowers, any number of variations where canopy uh, would be a, a better diet line and the growers do whatever they do within that square footage rather than a plant count. I don't mean to open a can of worms, but just something else to think about in terms of mixed tier 
Uh, what originally got me to raise my hand again, though, is asking uh, from the flip side of Nick, who just spoke of how to send his cannabis off to a manufacturer and how to get some kind of collaboration going or what his product might look like with his brand on it, but made from another company, extractionist manufacturer. I would come at it from being the solvent, maybe like tier three solventless uh, manufacturer and wanting to know what that handshake or business or permitting would look like uh, between those two entities. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Thank you. Yep, thank you. All right, we had um, a couple people raise their hands who have not previously commented. So, uh, Pepper, would you like to move on to them first? Uh, yes, please. And then, but just kind of keep the the order of the repeat commenter commenters in your mind, yep. if you can. Yep. Yep, I've got that. Uh, so, Fran is next. Hello, everyone. I'm Fran Janik down in Jamaica. I'm a medical patient and a grower and an advocate for other medical patients in the state. Uh, one of the things that's come up is uh, the limits on concentrations. And it comes to mind that in Act 86, any Vermonter who has a home grow is allowed to use an ethanol process to create a tincture or a, an oil from it. And that is not limited uh, to, in, in, by any percentage. It, it really would not be realistic to do that and again i would reiterate that if you're going to limit anything on percentage you're going to force the grower or the processor to add another substance to the process uh, so my concern would be a conflict with act 86. i will simply go on to say that i agree with amelia glenn nick and a few of the other people especially the two gentlemen that spoke initially this morning i think the less that we contain and control and the more that we help people to get into the system so that we can regulate the system, that we will do better with it. Thank you so much for having my comments today, and I will be submitting some comments of right. Thank you, Fran. All right, Evo is next. Hello again, everyone. Um, so a couple things. Uh, one, you know, I really want to echo this thing about testing. The three, that three-week period, a lot of times you're not even going to have cured cannabis by then. Um, and I, I do think that probably with, when it goes into packaging is the correct time because by that time your cannabinoid profile, terpenes, pesticide, whatever, anything you're testing for will be present, you know, and I, I, I think that's a really important, important piece. Um, also, you know, I, I want to ask again, I know this has been said before, um, you know, what, what we can do as the community to try to remove this 92% vape tax. I mean, this is a, you know, upwards of 20% and growing in the market is the vapes. And to, you know, to have somebody pay like 100% tax on it is just not, not good for anybody. Not, not good for our space, certainly, and will drive people to the legacy or black market or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then the one other thing on vape, I've heard this from me a couple times, and I haven't really seen any regulation around it, but, uh, you know, I do ask that we make disposable vape products I, I think we should ban them in Vermont. It's not sustainable to throw a battery out for every half gram of oil you're consuming. Um, I, you know, I've seen this category grow when I worked in the California space, and it was just disgusting to me to see how many companies jumped on the bandwagon to these disposable pens, which in a in a tourism in a, it puts like a lot of tourism. People like that because they're you know they don't want to take it with them necessarily, but you can still throw away your battery if you need to. Um, so just something to think about, you know, with the product and anyone listening as a, as a brand or a manufacturer, uh, I also ask you that you, you know, try to leave the disposables to the wayside. Like let, you know, let the other states do them if they want to, but you know, Vermont, so I don't think that's what Vermont's all about. So I, I would love to see that in there. And then again, THC caps is not gonna allow our marketplace to create the best products we can make manufacture cultivate vermont is known for quality products and i would hate to see us be subpar like in the canvas space that's thank it thank, thank you thank you all right mariah is next hi 
Thanks, Mariah. Thanks for, for flagging that for us. Thank you all very Thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, Amelia's next. Hey, um, just came to mind while I was listening to everybody, uh, especially the people who are mentioning outdoor plant counts um, and possibly wanting to shift to higher tiers in the future. Um, something that I would love to see us move away from in regard to plant counts that I know I've talked about before is um, eliminating the immature plant count cap. If we are capping mature plant counts, there really is no need to cap the immature plant count. Um, I think any of the growers on this call would probably agree with me on that. There are just so many things that you can't guarantee in growing. And one of those things, if you are growing from seed, is the number of males versus females you're going to have. Um, and also, if you are in the medical space, uh, like I know a couple of the other people on this call are, and you are trying to breed new genetics that work better for medical patients, that's really hard to do when you are capped on your immature plant count because you are not able to sort through your phenotypical expression uh, quite as easily when you are limited on the number of immature plants that you can have. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to address um, that I really don't feel like I should have to, but I'm going to, uh, is somebody earlier said that the goal of, you know, prevention is that nobody should be on substances. And as a medical patient, I, I really take that, <laughs> I guess, personally, 70% um, of Americans are on pharmaceuticals and we have an endocannabinoid system. We don't have an endo non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug system. We are not made to interact with things like Tylenol. We're made to interact with cannabinoids. Um, and I just think that when we say things like people aren't supposed to be using substances, we're cutting out a huge portion of the disabled population who rely in some way or another on a substance. And if, if you give me the choice, between an opiate or ibuprofen or Tylenol or something like cannabis, I'm gonna choose cannabis every single time. And I'm somebody who has been put on things like Dilaudid and fentanyl. 
and I still choose cannabis over everything because it is the least damaging thing to my body in the long term. Um, so just pointing out that saying that the goal should be that people aren't on substances is extremely, like, it, it excludes so many people with disabilities. Um, yeah, so that was all I wanted to say. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks for keeping an eye on us, always. All right, we have uh, Jeremy Collins, who has not previously commented. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeremy Collins. I live in Winooski. I am 29 years old, and I'm a medical patient in the state of Vermont. I've been a medical patient for about five years. Um, one of the biggest issues I've had with the medical program is the lack of individual batch testing results. Um, I've asked series slash you know, valid dispensary many times for those over the years, and managers always said they'll get back to me, and they never do. Um, personally, I have an issue with the THC cap because I am a medical patient for a variety of reasons. I've been put on muscle relaxer when I was about 15 years old just to sleep. I've been put on all sorts of uh, variety of pain meds. I wake up every single day and have a headache about an hour and a half after waking up. It's not a migraine, but it's a headache that's there all the time. I've been going to physical therapy. I've gone to chiropractic that does preventative work. And to be honest with you, the only thing that really touches my pain that isn't uh, Advil, Tylenol, or something harder is uh, medical cannabis patches. Uh, the one-to-one -one patches I find are really good for myself. Uh, other than that, the only thing that can help me really are the high concentrate THC uh, concentrates. So those are the only things that affect my pain. And as a 29-year-old active uh, serial entrepreneur in the area, it's very tough for me to manage that, especially with uh, low caps. That would force me back into the black market where I've previously done most of my uh, medicine seeking. So I just am speaking out for all those medical patients that you know I have arthritis too. I've got you know, a variety of things going on. I could take 10 pills for probably each one of those different things. So I have to not so, Thanks for your time. You guys are doing a great job, and I appreciate all of you listening. Thanks, Jeremy. All right, Tito is next. I know that I've commented about the vape tax um, endlessly, but I, I guess I've just been inspired by all these other comments. Um, but before I talk about that, I, just, I do want to agree with Amelia. Uh, I mean, the demonizing of this planet just knows no bounds. It's amazing. Um, but with the vape tax, um, you know, uh, it's Act 28. I have it in front of me, and it's amazing. It's pretty small. And it's amazing how small the adjustment has to be to basically just eliminate all cannabis intended vape products from this uh, legislation. Um, it reads uh, Act 28, Taxation of E-Cigarettes. Effective July 1st, 2019, the definition of other tobacco products it is expanded to include tobacco substitutes, which, which include e-cigarettes and any liquids, whether nicotine-based or not. Just that little evil little comment, we just get that out of there and the whole thing is good. And then in the next paragraph it says, uh, uh, that contain or are designed to deliver nicotine or other substances. It's like, what is that? Um, you know, this is a, it was designed for, um, uh, to attack nicotine they problems in high schools, uh, specifically with jewels. Uh, why, why these other little comments were thrown in, I, I have no idea. Uh, but, but that's how little has to be done to, to make this right. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Tito. All right, Sean. I just wanted to double back to the training uh, portion as it might relate to a cannabis employee identification card and to strongly support the identification cards are held by the individual, by what you're calling an employee currently, and that it's not necessarily held or operated or at the behest of a company, a retailer, the license holder. Uh, it doesn't allow a lot of room for an individual or an employee to be able to move companies, be able to just be a worker in the marketplace, in a free marketplace where their labor, they're free to take wherever they want. Uh, and so that identification card is you guys keeping records and making sure that a person's not... Uh, you know, an unsavory character, but it also should tie into the tra training where training 
is through the state and is to the state guidelines rather than an in-house training provided by a company. And so it would, any of those card holders would need to re-up with the state upon whatever timeline you agree upon. And we'd have to still suss out whether it's upon the employee to continuously make sure that they're good or when they enter into employment with a company, the HR person of that company needs to just always be checking records and be like, hey, we see your, your cards lapsing. Uh, get it re-upped before it closes or we'll take you off of the schedule until you can show us your card is renewed. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. So um, anyone who joined by the link, please um, just raise your virtual hand. Um, we'll call you in order. Um, and if anyone joined by the phone, um, it's star six to unmute yourself. And if you want to make any comments at any point, feel free to join us here at the table. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, again, um, this is our public comment period. Um, you know, we are collecting all of these comments and we're going to kind of systematically over the next couple of weeks go through them um, in a public meeting setting, respond to them, um, make changes to our proposed rules. And then, um, and then move on to kind of the next phase, which is really uh, appearing as a board before um, the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. Um, so, um, yeah, we're gonna stay here um, till at least 11, um, I mean, one o'clock, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, and, <laughs> and so, you, you know, feel free to raise your hand at any point um, or kind of chime in. Fran has raised his hand again. Fran. Hi. I'd like to say to the board that as you go to the legislature, we will be right behind you or in the meetings with you. And I am already in contact with my legislature, legislators elsewise. And I'd like to give a high five to what Amelia has just said. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. Ben is next. Hello again, everybody. Um, I apologize because this may be addressed elsewhere. Um, it is also kind of a tap on to one of the gentlemen who commented earlier about wanting to be able to move his license. Um, so this is just a, a general comment question to be addressed at some point. Uh, with regards to the licensing process applications, um, I have heard questions from some folks about what happens if they uh, are not ready to apply during the set application period. And to the best of my knowledge, all I've said is that um, there probably will be other application periods, they just have not been announced yet. So any clarity around that would probably be helpful for people, especially as we know the, the location search can be um, a big barrier in getting to that point. Um, and then in the same vein for folks who apply but their application does not pass muster within that one month application period, whether or not their application would be kind of open and able to be completed, uh, you know, if there would be a time limit, when they would have to be completed, or if the board's granting of licenses will be limited to just that one month period, or if uh, basically an application submit during the application period can be approved at any point beyond the month that follows the application period. So sorry, a little bit of a clunky question, but definitely something I've heard conversation around. So any clarity along the way would be great for folks. Thank you. Thanks for flagging that, Ben. We will definitely um, discuss that and get some guidance out around that. <clears throat> Amelia is next. Hi again. Um, <laughs> I just uh, I've heard the, the the vape tax thing brought up a few times now, um, and I just wanted to make it clear to everybody on the call that um, that's that's not within the CCB's jurisdiction to change. Um, that is a legislative thing that has to go all the way back through the state house um, in legislation. It's not just a rule that the CCB can change the wording of. Um, 
but I really love all of the support that's been thrown on this call, especially behind eliminating um, that tax for cannabis intended use. Tito and I, I just want to let you all know that um, Tito and I actually have a petition going right now um, to eliminate that tax on cannabis intended use vape products. Um, so if anybody here really wants to change that, they can sign the petition and there will be movement going forward um, to address that in the state house, but it is not an issue that the cannabis control board can just like snap their fingers and, and uh, solve. Um, thank you. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, let's see. I think Jeremy is next. Hi. Uh, first time joining you all. Uh, my concern with the tax for the vaping and support of the concern for the overtaxing of the vape products would be that, especially in the infancy of a cannabis industry where there's outdoor growers, new growers who are going to be met with challenges that they, they, they don't even know. We, we all don't know yet what kind of challenges might still be facing us all, but we do know the ones that we've already met, which are, you know, our, our seasons are quick and harsh and uh, mold and mildew and pests are, are, are out there. Um, remediation of those products through processes of extraction and um, distillation are how we can keep quality, healthy products in the marketplace. And also, if, if you're overtaxing it, you, you, you're creating a disposition for anybody who wants to manufacture and sell here, if they're near a bordering state that doesn't, that, that they can't compete with in product and cost. So, I uh, appreciate it. That's just my two cents um, as somebody who's considering getting into distillation here um, and uh, extraction. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Taylor. Hey there. It's uh, Taylor Carpenter with Gaston Weed Company. Um, thank you guys so much for this. Um, you know, I know you. I know you've heard a lot about the THC caps and a lot of people talking about it. I just wanted to just kind of say a few things. I was thinking about it, um, you know, for, you know, so I'm, I'm very familiar and um, experienced in testing a lot of products. And, you know, what, something that just really is scary about this, you know, even if it, even if it gets raised to 30%, you know, even if that's something for the flower, um, it's just, you know, test results can vary so much right so it's like you know you could bring you could cut down your plant you know take a nut take a nugget or you know take some and, and go test it take some from that exact plant go test it and it, it can vary tremendously and you know i think for that poses a risk on 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 every kind of you know person in this industry you know for the growers you know as as a grower if we grow really great flower and it's testing it 29 percent and we're right below that and you know hey that's that's great and this is this is awesome flower and then say that very next harvest that could test at 31 percent of that same exact you know genetic from a clone from that plant could potentially test above that you know and then we would have to throw away or, or whatever do something with that and then another thing too with that is just you know, kind of the fake testing result, or, you know, that you can do. You can take stuff from the bottom of your plant, the stuff, you know, the flower that's less developed, and maybe test that, and, and, and it'll test a lot lower, but then you're pumping out that higher quality flower. So there's just a lot of things that kind of, you know, brings up. And then another thing, too, is, you know, as, as far as, like, a law perspective, I mean, there there are people's you know, jobs and missions to go out there and sue people for false advertisement on packaging. So, I mean, if we're if we're putting out there like this is 29% and a consumer goes and buys a bunch of it and tests it, like who are we, you know, how are we gonna be protected by the state of Vermont to not get sued by that? And I think that's a good, you know, something to bring up just in general, because there are people that are gonna be doing this. Um, and then just kind of the last thing, like, 
we have a really good buddy that is um, kind of been helping us out with some stuff, but and he's from Vermont, but he just opened a pretty big, um, you know, business in uh, Massachusetts, a store, and they're doing grow, dispensary, kind of the whole nine yards, and they're producing some really great flour, and all that flour, and you know, this is right over the border of Vermont, so, um, you know, he, he has a few strains that he's pumping out that are over 30%. And, you know, I'm not big on that. I think, you know, as a weed connoisseur, I really don't care about the weed percentage or the THC percentage. But the, a lot of the consumers do. And I know that that flower that's over 30% advertised on his, you know, menus and stuff is pumping out the door. And so if we're going to, like, regulate that here, you know, what's going to stop people from bringing it from Massachusetts and, and bringing it from all these places around us that are not proposing that cap? So I think even, you know, proposing the 30% is, is still a stretch, and I think that puts everyone in the business at risk. Um, so, yeah, I hope that gets, uh, gets talked about a little bit more. But thank you guys so much, and uh, have a great day. Appreciate it. Thanks, Taylor. Next is Tito. Hey, so just a, another a couple things about the vape tax. So um, it is true that the CCB cannot just um, snap their fingers and make this change, but the CCB can add it to their recommendations, and um, that could help add a little bit of momentum to our petition, Amelia. And but also, as a future uh, cannabis retail owner. We need clarity. I mean, the current dispensaries don't have to pay this vape tax on the same items that that I do. Um, and so when we all become cannabis retail, what's going to happen? It's just really unclear. So um, maybe just for that alone, we need some clarity. Thank you. Thanks, Theo. Sean is next. Yeah, I just want to echo from a non-store owner. We we understand that you all cannot just snap the fingers. We're just you know hoping that you hear enough traction from us. It goes in certainly. Um, in terms of THC caps, it's been largely based. You know, the conversation has been 30% flour. Um, I happen to be a solvent-less concentrate producer, and 60% uh, is the current cap. That can be achieved through very simple, uh, non-solvent, non-lab-based methods. Uh, that needs to be increased significantly or removed entirely, or perhaps the compromise is made where if a concentrate is produced and sold on the market that is, say, 90 plus percent, that there needs to be some form of minimal CBD content along with uh, the T high THC potency. Uh, you know, I think the concern is that folks are consuming very high rates of THC and experiencing all of these health issues that we keep being scared by in the headlines. And we also know that CBD is essentially the the other compound that can mitigate those health concerns that have been a news crisis recently. And so if if, so, if concentrates are made that are high potency, uh, the CBD uh, factor could potentially be a, a compromise where an increase of that cap or removal of the cap would be much appreciated. And then also as it relates to testing, um, any, any real solventless concentrate hits that 60% just kind of in the, in the first stage, be it dry sifting, ice water extraction, or rosin pressing. And then as you take those and continue to refine them, you can move into the 80 or 90 plus percent realm very quickly. Those products are full spectrum, though, in the sense that you are pulling all cannabinoid and terpene content in that process. And that'll certainly help in that compromise of having not just a 95% THC product that has no other uh, remedial or like medicinal value to it. As it goes into testing, if I were a solventless manufacturer and I were acquiring cannabis from a cultivator who has already tested their product for mold, pathogens, other contaminants, if I were to show clear chain of custody 
from that cultivator that it is a clean product, would I still be beholden to test my final product for mold, pathogens, contaminants, or would I just merely need to show uh, potency, other cannabinoid and terpene uh, content in my final testing there? Um, I will say that solvent-based products can be safe. The process of solvently extracting, using solvent to extract a product is inherently dangerous. The product itself is not inherently dangerous. Solventless extraction in, the term, in terms of rosin pressing and rosin production, if you press a cannabis that does have mold, uh, other contaminants, mildew, anything in that regard, that does wind up in the rosin product. And that is certainly a health concern. And so people that are in that manufacturing space do need to either be able to show chain of custody that their product is clean. If they cannot show it, then yes, they would need to final test their product for mold pathogens, other contaminants, along with a potency and terpene profile. Um, so any other understanding or clarity that the board can get on solventless it, it's a, a very small craft niche market everybody's really been focused on big lab chemical extraction so any any clarity that you all can start giving to solventless uh, operations would be very much appreciated thank you thanks sean jeremy Jeremy Martin. Uh, I, 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 can, I can appreciate uh, being in Vermont as, as the gentleman before is expressing um, using, you know, uh, natural extra extraction techniques and non solvents and uh, hydrocarbons. But uh, he also did say uh, that, you know, and I would agree that it can be done safely. However, these things weren't being done safely in the past. And for good reason. <laughs> they, uh, but now that these opportunities have arised, we're taking technology that's 50 years old that was cleaning salt out of water on submarines and, and, and reusing film distillation to distill THC out of cannabis. I mean, there's lots of great R&D and science ahead of us. I don't want to see us get bogged down and trying to limit things to this craft, you know, natural, <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a, there's, there's also science out there. So I can appreciate the, the green flower and, and the love for the plant and growing outdoors and everything, but there's also a plant that has real medicine and cannabinoids and terpenes and medicinal things that we perhaps don't even know about yet. So, just want to keep an open mind while we're discussing the future of cannabis here. Thanks, Jeremy. So um, we're in the kind of final stretch here. Um, you know, uh, if you'd like to make a comment, um, please raise your virtual hand. If you're on the phone, um, hit star six to unmute. Um, of course, we have. Michael in the room with us here. Uh, anytime you want to chime in, please feel free. Um, so I see Don. Hi, how you doing? Good. Oh, great. Hey, I just want to second what Sean said about people and having people have individual licenses that will allow them to transport themselves to work for different outfits. Because as an owner operator, a small owner operator, you don't always need a lot of help, but during harvest or during planting or in different times of your operation. So there should just be an easy way for people, not entities, not businesses, but people to be able to get into this industry, to be able to earn a living and, and help the whole industry grow. Thank you for listening to me. Hope to talk to you guys again. Thank you. Evo. Okay, one more, one more. We got a few minutes here, right? So, um, 
<clears throat> this is to do with the delivery and special event licenses. Um, you know, what, what makes sense the most to me would be to tie the delivery directly to a retail. And I would love to see that be kind of part of the retail license, right? So if you, if you are a retail store, you have the right to deliver. I mean, it also makes sense just on a database thing, right? Like you have all your, your customer information, it's all tied to metrics, so your inventory management and your customers. Um, again, we're already going to have that infrastructure, so I think I think that's a really good thing to add on to a retail license. And then with the special events, well, you know, I know we've talked, I heard a lot about like weddings, this and that, right? What I didn't hear about, and something that I've experienced in California, is trade shows. So you know, when it's when it's trade show season or whatever, and all these brands are trying to sell their products to different retailers. Um, it'd be nice to be able to go to a trade show and then have those retailers actually try some of the products. Um, what I've seen work at like the, the Hall of Flowers show, which is a pretty um, popular and successful show, um, is they, they tie a retail, like a retail store would be tied to the event and sets up like a little pop-up dispensary. Then every brand can give out tickets, you know, for their sample product, which is again, through metric inventory, um, and then you would go basically pay like one dollar. You pay one dollar and you get your package of samples. And then a lot of times there'll be like an outdoor consumption area. So it's no no consumption inside. Um, but just something to think about is the whole trade show aspect as we're like you know creating this marketplace and this, this space. And I, I think that was kind of skipped over when we talked about special events and stuff. So I wanted to bring that up. Um, and I think that's probably it. Thanks, Evo. Any other uh, last comments um, from um, from folks, Sean? Uh, yes, just to piggyback off of that, as special event gets kind of more flushed out, how two point three point nine might need to be revisited. Um, I mentioned it earlier, just from like a general business to business locally of day in and day out people bringing samples um, but then yes now as it relates to trade shows specifically does 2.3.9 need to be amended at all thanks for that yeah was that fran saying that went up also yep yes just one more thing anecdotally regarding events um, I'm a uh, founding member of the Vermont Association of Wedding Professionals and a board member for eight years and I've been photographing weddings, that's my other job, in uh, Vermont for oh, almost two decades. And uh, I've, at every wedding I've ever been to, I've never seen a problem with people using cannabis. Yes, they had to sneak off into the woods, but the, even the, the weddings that I've done with police officers there I would always ask one of the officers who didn't seem to be drinking what he would prefer to have people do it. And he always preferred a room full of people smoking cannabis to a room full of people drinking alcohol. And that's done right in front of all the children. They drink alcohol at weddings right in front of children. So I think we should be open to the idea of having a small event permit, um, even a, a entrepreneur or, or, or an individual who could purchase uh, wholesale and then go to the events and sell that retail and that would make it actually profitable for that individual so that's just a little bit of anecdotal evidence there you go thanks Fran so oh Nick Well, so we're really closing in on the hour. Any last kind of final thoughts? Nick, we saw your hand go up and then go down. If you'd like to make a, you might be the last commenter here. Uh, thanks, can you hear me? Yep. All right, great. Uh, just wanted to second some of the comments from the last two callers on the, on the, uh, the the events, um, I think that is definitely something that needs to be uh, looked at again. And um, speaking on, on metric, I'm, I haven't been able to 
tune into all of these meetings lately, but uh, I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not there's been any movement on what the seed to sale will look like and, and how that will be implemented and who will be implementing that. And uh, one other concern that I wanted to briefly mention that I know has been, I, I, I was brought it up many months ago and I've, I've heard recently a few other cultivators bring it up. Um, it has to do with the initial rollout and in, in other states, other cultivators that I've worked with in the past, uh, when they are transitioning to a track and trace, um, they've already been cultivating. So there's already a product and plants in the, in the system um, and they're then transitioning into a track and trace system. I know here in Vermont, we're gonna roll out at the same time, uh, track and trace at the same time that, that rec sales begin. Uh, and uh, it's a big concern to me and to other cultivators that um, we're able to bring uh, plants into the building to begin, uh, you know, cultivation. Many, many cultivators here in Vermont are already growing either under a medical license or under the, the home grow provisions and, you know, being able to bring in our, our own cultivars uh, during that initial, initial period, I really think that we see and, and, uh, an open period uh, in track and trace where we can bring uh, cultivars to either from friends or our our home grows or our medical grows into commercial production. Uh, and uh, the, the last point uh, I would make on, on that is uh, regarding the cost of that system, uh, whether or not we're going to have to pay for that uh, system and also whether or not uh, as far as testing goes, we'll, well, what, what does it look like? Uh, I, I have my friends in Oregon out there, the testing labs come to you, they make their own selections. Um, so it's a, like a real clear chain of custody. custody and uh, I, I'm curious what, what that will look like uh, in Vermont, whether or not we have to supply the samples, whether or not they will be coming to, to get them. And most importantly, who's, who's gonna be paying for the track and trace system? And, and what system will it be? Great, yeah, we'll have some clarity and guidance around that um, as well. So um, thank you all for, for all of the comments, not just today, but throughout this process. Um, this is not your last opportunity. Our official public comment period um, will remain open um, through next week. We have, um, through our website, an ability to submit comments. There's a public input portal, um, a button. Um, and, uh, you know, we will, again, anything that comes in during the next week or so, we will kind of systematically go through. That's not to say that if you comment after that, that we can't consider it. We certainly will. Um, it's just uh, the kind of Administrative Procedure Act has a, a defined period here. Um, and we have the ability to change these regulations um, throughout this process. Once they become effective, we can start the process over again. I know almost every other legalized state has, you know, multiple iterations of their rules every year. They're kind of back at it, fixing unintended consequences, um, modifying things that they are reflective of, of the times, of the kind of new science, new research. Um, so I don't expect our rules to be permanent, um, but um, we really appreciate everything that you've given us to work with. Um, and, um, you know, stay tuned for some of the answers to the questions that you've pr presented to us. Stay tuned for um, us kind of considering each comment individually and modifying our rules accordingly. So um, with that, uh, is there anything, Kyle, Julie, that you'd like to add? echoing your comments and thanks to everybody that's joined us today or at any meeting over the past nine months and, and given us direction feedback good or bad <laughs> so thank you great well um i'll adjourn the meeting for today um just a reminder that our meeting next week will be on tuesday monday is a federal holiday um so our meeting will be on tuesday at 11 and it'll be live streamed or here at the cannabis board Thank you all.